4.3 billion people live across this vast continent called Asia, and we are telling their stories. On this edition, recovering a lost art. How some Afghans are trying to revive their country's film industry and pushing the boundaries of television. Writing on the wall. A group in Pakistan enlists the help of ordinary citizens to clear Lahore's walls of hateful graffiti. And weaving a bright future. An ancient art is giving China's Yi women not only a living, but also empowerment. I'm Natalie Carney, and this is Assignment Asia. Welcome to the show. Art is not only a form of expression, but also a window into societies. And that's particularly true for film and TV. But in Afghanistan, that art form has crumbled under decades of war and oppression. Now, some Afghans have taken on the task of restoring their country's films, hoping to bring the industry back to its former glory. As I discovered in Kabul, television is also defying Afghanistan's conservative culture, even in the face of danger. These images have never been seen by outside eyes. They reveal an Afghanistan long forgotten. It's a miracle these pictures are even being witnessed at all after being lost long ago in a mangled hoard of film that has undergone years of corrosion. This film is a film that is in the ولی ما این فیلم چند بار پاکوری میکنیم بعد از پاکوری به این شکل به شکل درست میشه بازو فیلم ما در ماشین مندازیم موقعی که در ماشین انداختیم اویت فیلم مالم میشه که فیلم افغانی است خارجی است چی است شما میبینید که فیلم آماده کار است به این قسم جاینا داره که از ماشین تیر نمیشه سال جاینا داره بلاست ما گذر سین که ما این فیلم با این فیلم قطع کنیم دوباره که اسپلایسر بکنیم با خاطر سرد بودن فیلم یک کپی از بین رفته است. ما کوشش میکنیم که ایده به یک کپی را حفظ کنیم از بین نره. و از جاتر فرمو یک با ارزش است او را ما دیجیتال میسوزیم. که زورت ما شوه از دیجیتال کار بگیریم. Ahmed Shah Siddiqui and Mohammad Qasim Karami were two of 11 men from the Afghan Film Commission that hid the negatives of some of Afghanistan's most revered films from the Taliban, a conservative and ruthless regime that ruled the country between 1996 and 2001. The Taliban banned all films and pictures, saying they were against God. But some of the films, including the ones in this shed, were not spared from the Taliban. باز تصمیم به میک زمان طالبان تصمیم به بردر دادن فلم ها گرفتن امی محل که فعلا ما قرار دادیم روز اول فلم ها را در انمی قسمه در دادن فلم ها را در دادن این دو داتش چیزا زیاد زبانه کشید گفتن که از ایباد روزانه پلچرخی ببریم باز قطعی های فلم خالی میکنند در داخل آرشیب فلم ها را دو موتر سی موتر امکانات روزی که بود According to Mohammed, 30 to 40 trucks full of positive films were burnt. They included Afghan productions as well as imported foreign films. But not all the roles were found. تصمیم گرفتن قطعی فلم قطعی آینیش پس کردن فلم هایی که در دادن و بعد از اون پلچرخیام می‌بودن قطعی را پس می‌کردن دو موتر فلم هایی می‌بودن پلچرخی در می‌دادن که در روزهای آخر که ممکن عکسشون پیش ما باشه که بعدن گرفتیم امی کو وارد این بغل انگار قطیای خالی فلم پد شده بود و ما که وقت میافتیم یگان قطی فلم ده مزیر قطیای خالی میزدیم که had the taliban found out about it the men say they most certainly would have been killed 
So this is the upstairs back of the shed. It was the films located in the front that the Taliban confiscated and then burned. So all the film that was hidden up here was not discovered. However, the Taliban later set light to the entire shed, and that's why some of the footage you see here has fire damage. Despite that, despite the very hot conditions up here, as well as other weather damage, this film, the film commission say, is relatively salvageable. So this film will later be restored digitized and then added to their archives. Today, this shed still stocks some of Afghanistan's most precious and valuable films. We were surprised and we were surprised that it was about 6,000 hours of film capable of seeing that the majority of the films are not only in the United States, but also in the United States, from all the issues of life and the people of Afghanistan and the economy. The whole thing is in the middle of the world, the wars, the Taliban no longer rule Afghanistan, but its conservative ideology still does, putting pressure on Afghan filmmakers, particularly those in front of the camera. Afghan actress Akila Rezai Kamel's family has received threats because of her job. The <laughs> فقط مشکلات محیطی اینا را و می داره که مثلا ما در سینما کار نکنم خانواده ما اصلا آر می دانستن که ما من حیث یک اونر پیشم در سینما کار بکنم Regardless of her awards and international accolades, Akila is estranged from her family. The conservative ideology that feeds public dislike of cinema has affected the industry. Industry film گفتن هم می دانیم که ما صنعت سینما داشتیم. از شروع با یک جنجال فرهنگی ما دچار بودیم. Some of the country's most internationally recognized works are also its most controversial. Osama was a film about a girl living under Taliban rule who disguises herself as a boy to support her family. It won a Golden Globe and earned almost four million U.S. dollars abroad, but was viewed negatively by conservatives in Afghanistan. This is Park Cinema in central Kabul, a dilapidated old building showing foreign films in a dark, grungy movie theater. Here is where we met Saeed Farouk Haibat, a cinema director for more than 30 years who has seen the industry crumble around him. Only four cinemas remain operational in all of Kabul. Old projectors, when working, show whatever films the theater can get a hold of to whoever is willing to watch them. Sharwali Kabul, lazim didan mara basfat mudiri cinema dar dar arse cinema dar imedat khidmatam kad si sal shar dar alat jam kandan as fakat ama kam onda ke nafas bar ayi ga basa shava. Shomo mi bini dami cinema park dana fardasi ta imna mey. Aga filmoi khub bosha wasail peshrafte tekniki khub wari chawa masraf kunan saith faru kaybat as mudiri mi cinema park. Saeed remembers a time when his theater was busy with people. Yet that final curtain has not yet been drawn, thanks to a few courageous filmmakers. In the television industry, defiance of Afghanistan's conservative norms is growing. Tolo TV is known for being a bit of a renegade for pushing the boundaries of Afghan society. Tonight is the finale of Afghan Superstar, a musical talent show, something unimaginable just a few years ago under the Taliban. This is the control room. This is where the magic happens. It's all on that stage down below that many of Afghanistan's top performing artists are breaking some of the country's most conservative traditions and pushing back against these taboos. But all this comes at a price. Insurgents have threatened to attack the performance. Security is tight as hundreds of audience members wait anxiously to get in. 
this show and what we see in the news, there's like a huge, huge difference. difference. It's, yeah. like, it's like water and fire, you know? Uh -huh. Like what's happening here? Mm -hmm. And the news, it's like the opposite. There's like yeah, bombs, there's war, yeah. there's killing. We were and really here it's like peace and like mm -hmm. fun, you know, you want to be here. What makes Afghanistan's superstar even more exciting and groundbreaking is its showcase of Afghan female talent. Ediana Saeed is one of Afghanistan's most popular female pop stars. She's also one of the most outspoken and has faced several threats to her life for it. I talk uh, uh, women's rights. I always uh, uh, believe in equality between uh, women and, and, and men, which is not normal in this country. They even announced a fitwa against me in one of the uh, very religious TVs. And they said, whoever brings Ariana's head uh, they will go to heaven. It's showtime. The host, well-known Afghan singer Noor Haya, takes the stage to a wave of applause. Four hours later, anxieties run high as the two semi-finalists are announced. Omid Parsa is named Afghan superstar. <laughs> اونا را ارائه میکردن مردم با دل و جان میشنیدن و میپسندیدن و نظر میدادن تاثیر خود گذاشته و مردم بسیار سعی میکنن تا جذب بشن با هنر و موسیقی و فعلا فکر میکنم دید مردم بسیار زیاد عوض شده ما با آینده افغانستان بسیار زیاد روشن پروگرام های مثل ابر ستاره حتما تاثیر گذاشته بود که اونا سعی میکنن تا در مورد کار ما نظر بدن but that is not what the conservatives of Afghanistan want, and the threats to the channel were finally realized on January 20th, 2016, when seven employees were killed and many others injured in a suicide bomb attack. The Taliban claimed responsibility, accusing Tolo of ideological warfare by trying to convert Muslims from their true beliefs. The Taliban have threatened other attacks should they fail to refrain from spreading propaganda and wickedness. Programs like Afghan Superstar have been spreading hope for people near and far. Award-winning documentary filmmaker Jawad Taiman came back to Afghanistan after many years abroad to try and save a dying art form. He's training the next generation of Afghan filmmakers. Taiman says these young, inspired filmmakers are driving the change his country needs. Film is media, and through this you can educate a lot of people, you can pass on a lot of positive messages. Um, and if you're an Afghan, you can make films about your country to show a positive image about your country rather than negative uh, stuff that, that, that's been shown on television. Back at the Afghan Film Commission, some of the country's timeless films are being archived for generations to come. Right next door to the hidden room he risked his life to build, Ahmed Shah Siddiqui is busy digitizing an old black and white Pashto film called The Silent Wander. It's one of the last works filmed before Afghanistan's civil war all but killed the industry. از انانی مردم افغانستان از آثار تاریخی کشورهای ولایت افغانستان در مجموع انانات کلی افغانستان و اون کلچرهایی که البته به گذشت زمان آیستا آیستا اما روش زمانی خود از دست داده و فعلا ما همونا را داریم حتی آثارات تاریخی که در اثر جنگا کاملا هست به این رفته ما همون آثارات در مجموع است اگر اراده خداوند باشه و این جنگ و تنظیمی از کشور کاملا برداشت شه میتونه با تصویر تصویرهای دست داشته افغان فیلم احیای مجدد آثار تاریخی در این کشور صورت بگیره و به نهای تاریخی غنی که در کشور است جای حوالی خود هم نتونه حفظ Government funding for these restoration projects remains scarce. Still, many continue to give their all to preserve the past and change the future through film and television. Cinema tanha sahtan film nis. Cinema yek farhang azimi az ki baad ba u bisar tawajush hot. I cinema ra az bain mibaran. Khodesh az bain namira. Az bain mibaran. Afghan films have been filling theater seats abroad, exposing the world to its repressive past and then pushing back against it. 
10 Afghan films produced with the support of foreign companies have been nominated for the Oscars foreign language category since 2002. And just like their brave predecessors, new generation Afghan filmmakers are taking it upon themselves to keep the momentum of change going through film and television, no matter what the cost. As efforts to revive Afghanistan's film industry continues, the country is becoming a popular location for foreign films because of its mountainous terrain and picturesque valleys set against remnants of war. Coming up, how one group in Pakistan have replaced offensive graffiti with inspiring paintings. Meet China's decision makers and thought leaders. See them in action, hear their views. Debate their policies. Meet China's leaders with me. I'm Robert Lawrence Kim. city of Lahore is notorious for traffic jams, air pollution and walls stained with hateful messages. But one group is looking to change all that through art. Daniel Khan met volunteers who are out reclaiming their city by painting over graffiti with inspiring images. With its majestic Mughal architecture and sprawling lush green lawns, Lahore was once known as the capital of gardens. But as the population rose, the city's landscape was also vandalized by unchecked and haphazard construction. And now, residents seem accustomed to ugliness and chaos. Piles of garbage, traffic jams, the air and noise pollution. Amongst the more disturbing eyesores are the graffiti like this that the walls of the city end up being stained with, often consisting of communal and sectarian hatred. Stained by vulgar language, the city's walls have seen layers of filth mounted over the years. But commuters recently came across a pleasant surprise. Instead of graffiti, there are now paintings. This is Mudassir Zia, the man behind the wall paintings initiative in Lahore. We want to change the look of the walls. When we go outside in the streets, we see the walls open, representing advertisement of different people, companies, some local doctors, and government slogans. Uh, after so many months, uh, we decided to paint them, to give them words, to give them uh, you can say a new look for the people, so they can uh, speak with the people, with the common people, a uh, people who are going through the streets, and they want to know what's positive happening in the Pakistan. In 2010, Mudassir and his team put up an art competition in Lahore. They used social media to gather like-minded volunteers from around the city. They called on anyone who wanted to paint. There are many people who are doing engineering degree or doing MBBS or doing CA, but they want to paint. So we decided not to restrict this event for only artists, professional artists. We want every person to come outside so that every person have a contribution for the society, for Pakistan. And people responded. The volunteers were initially divided into 60 teams, each with the desire to save their city's walls. Mudassar says that at first, passers-by thought they were a bunch of madmen. Even uh, the local government 
was totally shocked when we put the idea that we want to paint the walls, we want to remove the wall chalking. And they were saying, what will you do? How will you do? This low-cost initiative has brought together thousands of artistically inclined adults and children to improve the face of their city. They say it is a way for them to reclaim the walls of their city from messages of hatred and ugliness. The wall art is located at several crossroads throughout Lahore. There were very bad messages, political, religious, debates and stuff like that. So it was very, very uh, disturbing for the people to see that. It was some people would write very bad things with I can't say. So we wanted to clean it all up. We wanted to clean Pakistan. We wanted to recreate uh, the walls of Lahore. The walls are now painted with exuberant images from the abstract to the metaphorical. Each and every painting here has a message. Every person who passes by these walls will relate to the paintings in some way or the other. What we are doing is not wall chalking. We are spreading messages of peace, knowledge and harmony through color. I think it is a continuous way of conveying a message. I mean, when you watch television, the images come and go, but these walls remain here and constantly pass on positive messages. But in a mostly conservative society, initiatives like this are rarely accepted. Mudassir's team faced opposition and criticism, which they countered with paintings of positive and patriotic images of Pakistani culture and famous personalities. In 2011, uh, some mullahs uh, come at, at the place and they ask us why you are doing this, why you are going to remove the slogans uh, related to their madrisa. But we convinced them. We convinced them that okay, you write on the walls about your madrisa or any other thing or any other conference, that's not a right place to write this thing. Posters must be displayed on the cardboards, on the boards that are specifically for these things. So they agreed for that. It is not just a painting extravaganza. The team also hopes to educate people by painting messages of public service. There are always different themes around here. Where we focus on education, uh, rights for women, poverty, poverty alleviation. And uh, you see cultural impacts of Pakistan, cultural aspects of Pakistan. And how can uh, we promote different uh, good habits and good norms in Pakistan? Surprisingly, no one has so far tampered with the painted walls, a sign that the initiative has gained public acceptance. Mudassar hopes this would have a chain effect and that people in other cities would also save their country from hate and toxic ideologies that have been allowed to seep into the social fabric far too deeply. For Assignment Asia, I'm Daniel Khan in Lahore, Pakistan. Artisan hopes this low-cost scheme will continue to attract thousands of artistically inclined adults and children and empower them to improve the face of their cities. Next on Assignment Asia, the ancient art of embroidery and how it's empowering one ethnic group in China. Culture Express. See the world in color. Weaving amongst China's Yi ethnic group has a history spanning more than a millennium. But today it's not just a treasured form of art. In Yunnan province, embroidery has helped lift ethnic women out of poverty and empowered them to shape their own future. This is Dayao County, in China's Yunnan province. Rice terraces and mountains line the path to this county at the Chuxiongyi Autonomous Prefecture, a four-hour drive from the capital, Kunming. Here, we met the women of the Yi ethnic minority who are busy sewing and shaping their future with their own hands. They are the people of the Miyilu Cooperative, employing a style of embroidery called Yongren Yi, 
whose history spans 1,300 years and is part of Yunnan's intangible heritage list. In 2014, Miilu achieved an annual production value of more than 6 million renminbi, or almost 1 million U.S. dollars. At the workshop, the women say embroidery has helped them increase their monthly average income by 1,100 renminbi, or 177 U.S. dollars, and raise their status in society. But it wasn't the story years ago. Yunnan is one of China's less developed provinces, with around 18.3 million people living in urban areas and 28.3 million in the countryside. The Yongren Women's Federation hands out subsidized loans and microcredits to women in the embroidery industry. <laughs> Embroidery associations like Mi Yilu have been improving minority women's livelihood. Annual production can reach up to 200,000 pieces, and the products are sold to faraway Shanghai, Italy, and France. But how to market them better and bringing them out of the mountains into the wider world has always been a challenge. Well, e-commerce is the answer. The Miilu Cooperative has already started to sell its products on Alibaba's Taobao website, China's largest online retailer similar to eBay and Amazon. Hopes are high that the country's handicraft makers will be able to join China's e-commerce boom sooner rather than later. The women of the e-ethnic minority are keeping their traditions alive, handing them over from one generation to another. And with this unique skill, they are able to weave their way out of poverty. Ye weavers have been earning millions of won every year selling their handcrafted products. It's both a tradition and a business model they vow to keep alive for generations to come. You can find out more about this and all the stories on today's program on our website, www.assignment-asia.com. That's all the time we have for this week's program. I'm Natalie Carney. Thank you for watching and join us again on Assignment Asia. Share your thoughts and contribute story ideas for future shows by contacting us on social media.